Intrigue and lust for power shaped the world of the third century BC, the world into which Hannibal was born. His home was the legendary city on the coast of present-day Tunisia, Carthage. The storms of time have taken their toll. Today, only ruins remain where 2,000 years ago, a bustling city attracted traders and merchants. The Carthaginians were said to be sharp dealers. According to legend, even the foundation of Carthage began with a trick. It is said that an ancestor of Hannibal's, Princess Dido, fled across the sea from Tyre in modern-day Lebanon. Once in Africa, she begged a chieftain for a piece of land. The miserly ruler promised her as much as she could measure out with an ox skin. But he didn't bargain with the cunning of the princess, who cut the skin into the narrowest of strips. Laid end to end, they were long enough to mark off a piece of coast, the beginning of Carthage. There is a grain of truth in the legend. The Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a people who lived on the coast of Lebanon. The world owes them a groundbreaking invention, the forerunner of the Western alphabet. The Phoenicians also brought their religion from the Middle East. They worshipped gods like Baal Harman and Tanit, to whom they made human sacrifices. The Phoenicians also passed on the technique for extracting purple dye from the murex shell. In the ancient world, it was worth its weight in gold. As in modern Tunis, a colorful ethnic mix was found in the streets of Carthage. In its bazaars, every Mediterranean language could be heard, and Carthage drew merchants from all over the known world. Carthago was ja in erster Linie eine Handelsmetropole und die größten Gewinne hat man in der Antike im Handel erzielt, der Handel war zwar mit großen Risiken behaftet, gerade durch die Seefahrt bedingt, aber er brachte auch die größten Gewinne. Trade meant seafaring, and the Carthaginians were daring sailors. They navigated every coast from Egypt to Spain and even ventured into the stormy Atlantic to the far end of the known world. They ranged as far as England and the Canary Islands. By the third century BC, Hannibal's countrymen were the undisputed rulers of the sea. No nation could match their courage or seafaring skills. Carthage owed its wealth and power to its fleet. The heart of Carthage was its harbor. The outlines of the ancient port can still be made out in Tunis. It would be easy to take these lagoons as the work of nature, but they are indisputably man-made the remains of an architectural marvel from the third century BC. Excavations have shown that the Carthaginians had hundreds of docks made of brick. Ships could be hauled up on land for repairs. With computer graphics, it is possible to reconstruct this unique facility exactly as it was. Archaeologists calculate that in building this mammoth project, the Carthaginians moved a quarter of a million cubic meters of soil. When they sailed into this magnificent port, ancient seafarers must have been overwhelmed. The civil harbor was 150 meters wide and 400 meters long. On both sides were broad quays lined by the warehouses of the ship owners and merchants. It was an international trading port. Beyond it, and shielded by colossal walls, was the naval harbor, the heart of Carthage. No foreigner was allowed inside. 
Considered a wonder of the world in ancient times, this sophisticated facility could accommodate over 200 warships in roofed berths like modern garages. It was the most advanced shipyard of its time. Overlooking all was the Admiralty, housed on the central island, the perfect spot for keeping an eye on this gateway to the world. Carthage was mistress of the Mediterranean and the islands in it. Sicily, on Carthage's doorstep, was dotted with outposts of the great trading power. But in the north, a powerful enemy was on the rise, Rome. Though still a long way from the metropolis it would become, Rome was already making its bid for supremacy. Roman soldiers were tough, merciless and disciplined. In bitter struggles, the legionaries had subdued the whole Italian mainland. Now, with confidence in their armed might, they took on their powerful neighbor, Carthage. In a war that lasted nearly 20 years, Rome conquered the Carthaginian colonies of Sicily, Corsica and Sardinia, losses that brought Carthage to the brink of ruin. Around this time, Hannibal was born. The threat from Rome loomed over his childhood like a dark shadow. When he was nine, his father made him swear eternal hatred to the city on the river Tiber. Hostility towards Rome was part of every Carthaginian's upbringing. L'infanzia di Annibale dobbiamo immaginarla come l'infanzia di un di un bambino solo, di un bambino quasi subito schiacciato dal senso del dovere. Duty meant fighting. Hannibal accompanied his father on a campaign to Spain, which the Carthaginians had occupied in place of their lost colonies. In a strategically positioned bay, they founded a new city, Cartago Nova, present-day Cartagena. From here, they subjugated the Spanish hinterland, then inhabited by Celtic tribes. Que no tiene que ver con la defensa militar, pero sí con la importancia estratégica para el Estado cartaginés, es la existencia en su inmediatez, en lo que hoy es conocido como la Sierra de la Unión, de unas riquísimas minas de plata y plomo. In the ancient world, Spain was the land of silver. In fact, Spain produced silver right up to the 20th century. The Carthaginians wanted the precious metal, and Rome backed them. After all, a steady flow of silver to North Africa ensured the timely payment of the compensation that Carthage owed Rome after losing the war. Spain became Hannibal's second home. There, he was destined to follow in his father's footsteps as a statesman and soldier. But first, education. Hannibal was educated by a private tutor brought specially from far off Greece. Sosilos, a learned Spartan, instructed him in the classical subjects of the day. Greek literature, history, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and geography. My lion cubs is what the proud father Hamilcar called Hannibal and his younger brother Hasdrubal. He wanted them to be men who would make Rome tremble. And Hannibal had what it took. In Spain, he began his unique career. Rome hadn't counted on an enemy like him. At the age of 26, he decided to stake everything on a single card. He laid siege to Saguntum, a city on the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Saguntum was under Roman protection. Hannibal knew that the Romans would not tolerate this attack on their allies. And so, the battle for Saguntum became the prelude to an ancient world war. Es ist eine interessante Paradoxie, dass die Seemacht Karthago den Zweiten Krieg gegen Rom zu Lande führte. 
Ähm, dies war allerdings in Karthagern diktiert worden von den Notwendigkeiten ähm, der Tagespolitik. Karthago hatte ja seine Flotte abgeben müssen und besaß also keine Armada, keine Schiffe, um es gegen Rom aufzunehmen. Aus dieser Last machte Hannibal eine Tugend und erwog auf den Landweg die Römer zu bekämpfen. Hannibal had wanted this war. It was to decide where the future lay. With Rome or Carthage. 40,000 men, 4,000 horses and 37 war elephants. An enormous army advanced towards Italy. Hannibal knew that he had to take the initiative and carry the war to the Tiber, or else face the Roman legions on his own doorstep. He passed through the valleys of the Pyrenees in forced marches. His first goal was southern France. The Romans responded quickly, relocating troops to near present-day Marseille. This is where they planned to intercept their enemy. But they could not find him, and he vanished into thin air. Hannibal, an ingenious strategist, evaded the enemy and moved north along the river Rhone. Hannibal's war elephants were the trump card he intended to play against the Roman legions. The exotic giants were meant to demoralize the enemy by their intimidating appearance and then, quite simply, crush him underfoot. But before these tanks of the ancient world could be brought to bear, Hannibal faced another adversary, the Alps. They were the only way into Italy, for the route along today's French Riviera was then only a narrow track. A giant wall of rock and ice stood between Hannibal and his dream of victory over Rome. Hannibal's plan bordered on insanity. It called for the elephants from the African desert to climb through steep rocks and mountain passes almost 2,000 meters high. The strain on man and beast would be enormous. It was also a huge logistical challenge. The food for men and animals, the winter equipment and the weapons all had to be hauled over the mountains in icy conditions. No fewer than 40,000 men and 37 elephants had to cross the Alps on narrow tracks at dizzying altitudes. A crazy enterprise. A stroke of genius, for which Hannibal is still admired. Historians cannot agree, however, on the route that Hannibal took. Where Hannibal crossed the Alps remains a mystery. It is known that he set foot on Roman soil near the modern city of Turin. But how did he get there from the Rhone Valley? According to contemporary accounts, there were two main options, the southern route along the Durance and the northern one through the Isère Valley, both well-known trade routes even in those days. But which one did Hannibal take? According to ancient accounts, both routes were possible. And maybe Hannibal actually used both. There is reason to believe that he split his army in two and had each half advance separately. After all, 2,000 years ago, the only roads leading through the inhospitable mountains were narrow tracks at the bottom of the valleys. Here, men and animals could only walk in single file. 40,000 men would have made a line several kilometers long. The march would have taken weeks. Moreover, the rocky terrain offered little food for the animals. Splitting the army in two and sending each half on a separate route would have been a solution to this problem. Eine Aufgliederung des Heeres in verschiedene Gruppen hatte 
beträchtliche logistische Vorteile für die Versorgung der Truppen, für die Schnelligkeit beim Vorrücken und ist auch nun für Hannibal nicht eine ungewöhnliche Anordnung, denn eine Aufteilung des Heeres hat er bereits bei der Durchquerung des Gebietes äh, zwischen Ebro und den Pyrenäen vorgenommen. From the head of the pass, the army could see all the way to Italy. The goal seemed within reach, but in fact, the most dangerous part of the journey still lay ahead. The Alps had not yet been conquered. The descent into Italy was hampered by deadly precipices. What had begun as a strategic maneuver now brought heavy losses. L'esercito di Annibale nel momento in cui uh, arriva, uh, arriva sopra Torino, nel, nella zona di Torino, nella zona dei Taurini, della, della tribù gallica dei Taurini, è un esercito esausto, è un esercito sfinito. Hannibal had challenged fate. Did he overestimate his capacities? According to the ancient chronicles, the crossing of the Alps cost him nearly a quarter of his army. The losses among the war elephants were even greater. Hannibal's miracle weapon was faltering. Wasn't it an insane idea to begin with? Little Carthage versus mighty Rome? Can the Schweiz a war in Deutschland win? Can Litauen a war in Russland win? So, endlich muss man sich die Proportion vorstellen. Das Bevölkerungspotenzial der Römer war um ein Vielfaches größer als das der Karthager. But for the moment, it seemed that Hannibal was imposing his will upon the Roman senators. A Roman army ready to embark for Africa was recalled. It seemed Hannibal's plan of keeping the Romans on their toes at home was working. Battle was joined. The Romans challenged Hannibal's army near modern-day Turin with catastrophic consequences. The Roman commander was wounded and fell from his horse. The chronicles tell us that his son Scipio risked his life to save his father. Did the young Roman guess that this defeat was only a foretaste of worse to come? That his rivalry with Hannibal would change his entire life? Io credo fondamentalmente che eh, il sentimento che unisce, che unisce Scipione ad Annibale sia l'ammirazione, eh, anche se gli ha ferito il padre. Publius Cornelius Scipio became a general. He both feared and admired Hannibal's genius and he was determined to outdo him. Scipio was the complete soldier, clever and pious. Even as a young man he was talked about in Rome. He came from one of the noblest families, had received an excellent education and military training with it. Scipio was the most talented of Hannibal's enemies, a man who represented the best traditions of Rome. Völlig unterschiedliche Typen hier, der sehr geschliffene, äh, sich elegant ausdrückende Mann und auf der anderen Seite eben der knorrige Kämpfer, ein, ein Blüchertyp. Like Blücher, the Prussian general who never shed his uniform, Hannibal only ever knew the wandering life of a soldier. He was always on the move, side by side with Carthage's mercenaries, Gauls, Numidians, Iberians and Greeks, an army drawn from many peoples, deep in enemy territory. The charisma of their young commander welded them together. Le fonti sono concordi nel dire che Annibale non aveva nessun tipo di vanità, non aveva nessun tipo di vizio, di vizio comune. Annibale, Annibale veste come i semplici soldati, vesti molto semplici, le armi invece sono di altissima qualità. Annibale dorme in mezzo ai soldati, avvolto, avvolto in un mantello militare, ha, capacità, ha le capacità del grande comandante e l'atteggiamento del grande comandante. On a cold winter morning, Hannibal struck his second blow. The battleground, 
a plain beside the river Trebia. Rome threw in the army that had been bound for Africa. Now they were supposed to drive the invader out of their own homeland. Hannibal counted on the Romans' rage against him to lure the legionaries into fording the river. The ice-cold waters of the Trebia became his ally. The Romans fell into the trap. Shaking with the cold, they advanced onto the plain. Today, it's a potato field. Everything went according to Hannibal's plan. When the Romans launched their attack, they were almost frozen. They were already exhausted. And they were walking into an ambush. Hannibal's horsemen, nimble Numidians and strong Iberians, rushed from hiding to fall on the Roman flanks. 10,000 Romans were killed. Hannibal lost no more than a few hundred men. Rome's defeat was complete. Er hat dadurch die großen Schlachten gewonnen, indem er nicht nur auf die Phalanx, auf die Infanteristen gesetzt hat, sondern vor allen Dingen auf die beweglichen Kräfte. Wir würden heute sagen die Panzerwaffe, was damals die schwere Kavallerie war und hat mit der Kavallerie im Grunde genommen die Römer zum Fall gebracht. Hannibal had another secret weapon, a special unit that terrified the Romans. Balearic warriors used a slingshot platted from bast the flexible bark of the lime tree. It was a deadly accurate weapon. Ancient reliefs portray this light infantry wielding their slingshots. Were they really capable of doing serious damage? We held an experiment to test the capabilities of the ancient slingshot. The victim is a crash dummy normally used in testing safety features in cars. This test will measure the impact of a slingshot projectile. A high-speed camera demonstrates the secret. The swinging produces enormous centrifugal force that propels the stone with almost explosive power. We have ja bei unseren Versuchen Abwurfgeschwindigkeiten von bis zu 90 km pro Stunde festgestellt. Und wenn jetzt ein sehr kompaktes und formaggressives Projektil wie eine Stein- oder Metallkugel mit einer solchen Geschwindigkeit den menschlichen Kopf trifft, entstehen dort sehr hohe Flächenpressungen am Schädel. Und das kann dazu führen, dass der Schädel bricht. Und durch diesen Schädelbruch werden sehr oft auch innere Blutungen und Gehirnverletzungen erzeugt, die durchaus zum Tode führen können. Eine solche harmlos aussehende Steinschleuder ist also durchaus als tödliche Waffe zu sehen. Hannibal had the best troops of his time under his command. But was that enough? He was victorious, yet he was trapped inside enemy territory. The Roman fleet controlled the Italian coastline, cutting his supply lines across the Mediterranean. The land route was blocked by the Alps. He could expect no support from outside. His only chance was to be more cunning than his adversary. Rome, relying on superior numbers, sent fresh legions to face the Carthaginians on the shores of a small lake. Lake Trasimene. Ceaseless campaigning was taking its toll on Hannibal. An inflammation had left him blind in one eye. But this was no time to take it easy. A Roman army much larger than his own was approaching. Once again, Hannibal planned to use water and a ruse. During the night, he prepared a bold deception. By lighting fires along the lake shore, he gave the impression of an army camp to enemy scouts. In reality, he had moved his troops and they were lying in ambush. The idyllic lake became a deadly trap. At dawn, the Romans attacked what they believed to be a camp. And they were trapped between the lake and Hannibal's men. Once again, numbers were trumped by shrewdness and cunning. The battle went on for three hours. Thousands of Romans died. It was reported that the water was red with their blood for days afterwards. 
The location is still known today as Sanguinetto, the place of blood. Hannibal is eh, duro with the enemies because it would be duro, in my opinion, in the first place towards himself. The cioè, spirit of sacrifice, the sense of the duty in the confronts of the city that he represents are absolutely strong and absolutely total. Hannibal was born into a merciless civilization, a world that believed in cruel gods. According to ancient historians, the Carthaginian's god, Baal, demanded that they sacrifice their own children to him. And on what was once Carthaginian territory, archaeologists have discovered 20,000 graves with the charred remains of babies. These excavations confirm why Carthage had such a bad reputation in the ancient world. Die Kinderopfer der Karthager haben ihnen natürlich schon sehr früh sehr stark geschadet. Die Römer hatten auch Menschenopfer, in einzelnen Fällen, übrigens auch noch im Zweiten Punischen Krieg, aber sie wurden dann verboten und galten als barbarisch. Had Hannibal witnessed this horrific ritual? Was his own family affected? Especially at times of crisis, such as after the first lost war against the Romans, the Carthaginians tried to win the gods' favor by sacrificing children. A sacrifice that demanded absolute obedience to the law of the community. This is what young Hannibal might have experienced. His parents, too, might have sacrificed one of their children at a time of great hardship. We know that Hamilcar four sons had, but only three names are us true. Hannibal, Hasdrubal and Mago. It would be quite possible that the unknown, nameless fourth son damals als jüngster Sohn geopfert worden ist. The priest would take the child from its parents, kill it in a mysterious manner as the chroniclers report, and then commit it to the flames. Such an experience would have made a deep impression on the young Hannibal. To sacrifice for Carthage was the guiding principle of his actions as well. Annihilating Rome was his sacred duty, and now that goal seemed within his grasp. As Hannibal continued his march through Italy, the Roman Senate hastily recruited new troops and sent them to fight the Carthaginian. Who would be able to stop him now? Hannibal's troops had already reached the Adriatic. They were approaching a small, insignificant garrison named Cannae, a name that would go down in history as one of the most famous battlefields of all time. Hannibal set up camp near the small town and awaited the assault of the Roman legions. They came as he had expected. Rome had quickly levied fresh troops, a total of 80,000. They were supposed to put pay to Hannibal once and for all. Assembled on the plains of Cannae was the largest army Rome had ever mustered. But for the Romans, this field was to become the symbol of disaster. The Battle of Encirclement at Cannae has entered the annals of military history. To this day, it is regarded as a strategic masterpiece. These graphics show what happened. In the foreground, the Carthaginian army. In the background, the Roman legions. Hannibal's slingers struck the first blow. They launched a well-aimed attack and quickly withdrew behind their own lines. Next, the Carthaginian infantry advanced. They had a special task. They were to hold the numerically superior Romans and then gradually encircle them from the flanks. The Romans were unaware of their danger. The battle was decided behind their backs. 
Hannibal's horsemen quickly closed the trap, locking the Romans inside a ring of Carthaginians. Diciamo che Annibale sostituisce, eh, sostituisce, se mi passate un'espressione della morra cinese, sostituisce al sasso la carta, cioè invece del blocco che resiste, un centro che arretra e due ali che avanzano. È eh, la tattica straordinaria della battaglia di Canne, forse l'esempio più perfetto di manovra avvolgente dell'antichità. The end for the encircled Romans at Cannae. An entire army was crushed. It was a bloodbath of shocking proportions. Hannibal triumphed in Cannae over Roman legions that outnumbered him two to one. This earned him a reputation of total invincibility. Wouldn't Rome have to surrender to the man from Africa? How long could the Senate keep up these battles of annihilation? To the last man? The news of the disaster shook the city on the Tiber to its very foundations. The senators had sent their colossal army into the battle, certain of victory, confident that they would wipe the intruder from the face of the earth. And now, the shock went deep. But surrender, that word was not in the Romans' vocabulary. They followed their own logic. Nessuno è vincitore se il vinto non ammette di esserlo. Quindi i romani rifiutano di, di dichiararsi sconfitti, malgrado perdite, perdite spaventose, e resistono. But what were the consequences? Scipio narrowly escaped the inferno of Cannae after experiencing once again the military genius of the Carthaginian. Everything was at stake. Could Hannibal be stopped? Who could save Rome now? The gods? Hannibal anteportas! Hannibal at the gates! That horrified cry sounded through the narrow streets. With the days of Rome numbered, the Carthaginians were expected to besiege the city at any time. Weeks of waiting, weeks of fear, but Hannibal did not come. Why not? Hannibal's generals were perplexed. You know how to win, but not how to use your victory, they charged. They said he was frittering away the fruits of his great success. But Hannibal insisted, no attack on Rome. What held him back? Was it over caution, as some ancient chroniclers suggest, or was it rather far-sightedness? Auch Hannibal ging geschwächt aus Cannae hervor. Natürlich waren seine Verluste geringer als die der Römer, aber wenn man seine strategische Lage betrachtet, fern von seinen Operationsbasen, war es ihm nicht so einfach, sich Ersatz für diese Verluste zu beschaffen. Das war die entscheidende Voraussetzung, die ihn gehindert hat, nach Rom zu gehen, um dort den Krieg auf die Schnelle zu beenden. But was breaching the walls of Rome the only way to victory? The military strength of Rome did not rest on the city but mainly on the surrounding land, where the Senate recruited more than half its troops. However, these men were members of Italian tribes that Rome had subjugated in bloody battles. Now they had to serve in the army side by side with the legionaries from the Tiber, a forced brotherhood in arms. This is what Hannibal wanted to focus on. He wanted to get Rome's allies to switch sides. Die Bundesgenossen Roms sind auch nach Cannae Rom treu geblieben und haben sich gesagt, also lieber wollen wir mit Rom zusammen als von Hannibal abhängig werden. This time Hannibal had miscalculated. The allies of Rome refused to defect. And the Senate had learned its lesson. Consul Fabius Maximus simply let the invincible army run into the void. He refused to engage it. He went down in history as the conctator, the hesitator, but it became an honorific as his strategy of attrition was successful. An absurd situation. From then on, 
Hannibal marched without fighting on winding roads without a beginning or an end. It was a campaign without an objective, a victory without a conquest. Disappointed, Hannibal resorted to terror. Where persuasion did not work, he tried to force the friends of Rome to change sides. The countryside was laid waste. Two hundred thousand dead. That was the tally of the war so far. One third of all able-bodied Roman men. The madness had to end. Scipio's time had come. He was 23 when the Senate appointed him general, and the young leader had an idea as to how he could defeat the Carthaginian. Allora conviene reclutare come Roma fa 30 legioni e combattere Annibale dove Annibale non c'è, perché Annibale ha molti doni, ha molte doti, ma non ha la dote dell'ubiquità, non può essere dappertutto. Especially not in Spain. While Hannibal was wandering aimlessly through Italy, Scipio occupied the Carthaginian colony. To him, it was also a matter of family honor, for both his father and his uncle had lost their lives fighting Hannibal. Scipio's first major operation was a success. He took Cartago Nova by surprise, and with the fall of the Iberian capital, more than just the fate of the colony was at stake. After all, the silver mines had funded Hannibal's campaign. Now, the tide was turning. From now on, Rome would dictate the rules of the game. And in a foray into psychological warfare, they had a gruesome surprise for Hannibal. The Romans sent a bundle to the Carthaginian camp, a present, a severed head. From the distorted face, the lifeless eyes of his brother Hasdrubal stared up. Hasdrubal and his army had left Spain in an attempt to come to Hannibal's rescue. It was then that the Romans had killed him. The brother evoked memories of a shared childhood and a shared dream of conquering Rome. Now that dream had perished. I suoi fratelli non sono capaci. Filippo di Macedonia, suo alleato, non è capace. Solo lui. Ma il genio è lui. D'altra parte è solo. Hannibal now had to scramble to leave Italy because his own homeland was in danger. A Roman army had landed in northern Africa. It was encamped only a day's march from Carthage in a place named Zama. This little town would lend its name to the final act of the drama. Here, a man came forward who had awaited his opportunity for many years, Scipio. The Roman had turned the tables on Hannibal. Now he held all the cards. He was eager to confront Rome's great enemy, Hannibal, the man he hated yet admired. Scipione è come il cacciatore che ha stanato la preda, la preda grossa e non vede l'ora di abbatterla. Cioè, la, la, la. Però ammira il leone che ha di fronte, ammira il, il grand'uomo che ha di fronte, vuole misurarsi con lui. Before the battle, the two greatest military leaders of their time faced each other in the no man's land between the two armies. Hannibal wanted to negotiate. He offered Scipio peace, but Scipio declined. Did Hannibal have a premonition that he had finally met his match? For a long time, the location of this decisive battle was forgotten. It certainly had to be one of the ancient provincial towns surrounding Carthage, but their old names were lost in the mist of time. Only an excavation by the Tunisian archaeologist Ahmed Fajawi has shed some light on the mystery. He is convinced that he has finally found Zama. Au cours de la fouille, nous avons trouvé une inscription latine euh, signalant 
les habitants de Zama Regia. D'après la description de Polybe et de Tliv, cette bataille a eu lieu dans cette grande plaine entourée par des montagnes, non loin de Zama Regia. Two armies, each 50,000 strong, faced each other on the battlefield of Zama. Hannibal had supplemented his ranks with 80 war elephants from Carthage. The enormous animals were supposed to crush the enemy like modern tanks, but they were tanks of flesh and blood. A wounded elephant can no longer be controlled and often turns on his own master, as ancient historians report. Hannibal's secret weapon was a double-edged sword. But he had no choice. The elephants were followed by an army made up mostly of raw recruits. Hannibal's plan was to use his elephants to breach the legionaries' tight battle lines. But Scipio saw through Hannibal's game and was quick to react. Hannibal did not suspect that the Romans had any answer to his elephants. It was also the first time he had used such a large number of elephants, a fatal error. Elefanten waren furchterregend. Aber als man von römischer Seite, und das kann man bei Scipio sehr gut erkennen, die Vor- und Nachteile eines Elefanten erkannt hat und gesagt hat, mach Gassen, damit der uns nicht zusammentrampeln kann und versuche ihn in die eigenen Reihen wieder zurückzutreiben, dann war das mit Sicherheit keine sehr geniale Taktik, aber sie hat unglaublich gewirkt und hat zur Verwirrung bei den Karthagern und ihren Hilfsvölkern beigetragen, sodass der Überraschungseffekt mit den, mit den Elefanten, die sozusagen wie im Panzer eingesetzt worden sind, sich gegen einen gekehrt hat. Hannibal's attack failed and the rest of the Carthaginian army were no match for the Roman legions. The war was lost. Zama was just one defeat after an endless string of victories, but it was decisive. Hannibal lived to tell the tale. Scipio did not insist on having him extradited, but the senators demanded his head. Henceforth, Hannibal had to keep one step ahead of the Roman bloodhounds. He fled as far as Armenia. The man who had taught Rome the meaning of fear found refuge with the enemies of the new superpower, but never for long. The long arm of the Senate extended to the furthest corners of the known world. For 20 years, the prey managed to elude the hunters, but finally, they tracked him down. He was prepared for that moment. A lethal dose of poison ended his life. The year was 183 BC. The place, a small village in modern-day Turkey. Hannibal, once the scourge of Rome, died a lonely and miserable death. Wären seinen Würfe gelungen, dann hätte sicher die antike Geschichte einen anderen Lauf genommen. Insofern, als die Romzentrierung aufgehoben worden wäre und damit eine neue Perspektive in der Geschichte der alten Welt eröffnet worden wäre. The victory over Carthage was the beginning of Rome's rise to power, but it never forgot the 200,000 dead it suffered. After defeating Hannibal, Scipio had spared Carthage, but a new generation of Roman politicians demanded revenge. Cato the Elder concluded every speech he made by declaiming Carthage must be destroyed. His wish was granted. Almost 40 years after Hannibal's death, Rome once more declared war on Carthage. It was triggered by a minor incident. Following a siege of almost three years which almost starved Carthage to death, 
the legionaries stormed the city. In the massacre that followed, close to 80% of the population died in their houses and alleyways. The horror ended in the total annihilation of Carthage. It was the Romans' revenge for Cannae. Hannibal had sown the seeds of destruction and Carthage reaped the harvest. Carthage burned for 17 days and 17 nights. The flames reduced the once glittering metropolis to a smoldering heap of rubble. It was burnt to the ground, torn down, plowed up, and crushed into the dust. The conquerors sowed salt on the ruins. Nothing should ever grow on this soil again. No tree, no bush, no form of life. Legend has it that even the Roman commander had tears in his eyes when he saw the extent of the destruction he had wreaked. It is a bitter irony of fate that Hannibal's greatest victory led to the downfall of his own city. If not for Cannae, Carthage might have survived.